you have a Bible, go to the book of Titus. We're doing a verse-by-verse study. Through the book of Titus, we're in chapter 2. And today, we're in verses 11 through 15. So it's a short section, but a very powerful section about grace and about hope and about glory. So I want you to think of those three terms, grace, hope, and glory. And as you're thinking of those, stand with me and we'll pray together. Lord, we we thank you for the privilege of gathering together freely in the name of Jesus Christ and to open your word. Help us to never, ever take that for granted. And we ask, Lord, that you would take your word and like that good seed planted in our hearts and that our hearts would be good soil that can produce much fruit for your kingdom. Lord, help us to ever keep our eyes on the fact that you have a kingdom and it's what you allow us to invest in and participate in. And as we pray sometimes uh, that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven through us and in us and by your grace. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. So last week, the Apostle Paul, writing to Titus there on the island of Crete, a couple of things. He gave some admonitions and exhortations. Number one, for sound doctrine. And then he talks about, as we saw, the conduct or the lifestyle For older men, for older women, for younger women, for young men, and even for servants and slaves. And so perhaps the question arises of, well, how is it possible to meet or live up to these expectations and ethical demands that are placed on our lives by the gospel, by the Apostle Paul? And I believe he answers that question in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. How do I live this way? How do I, as an older man or a younger man or a younger woman or an older woman or a slave or a free man or whatever? Well, by God's grace. God's grace has appeared. And it's brought salvation to all men. Now, if I could define grace as simply as possible, I would say that it's the complete acceptance by God offering a relationship as a free gift. We don't deserve it. It's freely given. It's not earned. It's all because of his loving favor. His grace is the doorway, so to speak, to a transforming or transformed life by the power of Jesus Christ. By grace. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 says it perfectly. It says, by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should Walk in them. Grace is the free offer. I like to think of it like this. Grace is the knock on the door. Because he's God. He's powerful enough to push the door down. But he knocks. And he says, hey, if you'll open the door, I'll come in. If you'll accept me and my salvation, I'll transform you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, that's grace. And he offers forgiveness and cleansing and salvation. I can't earn it. He comes freely to my door and knocks. But to open the door, well, then that's faith. Okay, I'm going to trust. Okay, I'm going to believe. Okay, I'm going to accept this invitation of you calling to me and asking to come in. I'll, 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 I'll accept your grace by, by opening the door. And then his grace comes into your life and empowers you to live the way that he designed you and I to live. 
I, I think a great picture of grace is when the story of the prodigal son, he, he finally comes to himself and he's making his way home and the father sees him, you know this story, sees him far off and he begins to run to him. And, and, and the, the, the son is, is he's, I guess he's freaked out. He doesn't know what to say. He says, hey, just make me one of your hired servants. I'll work my way back into your favor. And the father goes, no, here's a robe. Here's some sandals for your feet. Here's a ring for your finger. And he kisses him. He says, you're my son. You don't have to work your way into my favor. What a picture of grace that is. Grace is Jesus washing the feet of Judas. Know that he's going to sell him out. Grace is Jesus washing the feet of Peter on that last night, knowing that he's going to deny him three times. Grace is God using someone like you or me in his ministry. I mean, can you imagine him using you or me for that matter? I mean, that, that's amazing grace. Using you or I to, to share his heart, his love with others, extending his favor, his kindness, his love to those who don't deserve it, just like you and I. That's amazing grace. Paul's reminding Titus of the grace and the truth of grace and how it enables us to live. So after he gives that exhortation of this is how all these people should live, he answers it by saying, for the grace has appeared to all men, teaching us, and this is what grace does, it instructs us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, and that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Here's what he's saying. When grace captures your heart, when you recognize what he's truly done for you through the cross, his love for you, and you become a recipient of his spirit and his salvation, he begins to teach you how to live a changed life. He, he describes it like this, one that is denying ungodliness, denying worldly lust, living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And let me just say this. Here's the deal. If Christ has not changed your behavior, if your lifestyle hasn't changed and your desires, and, and if there's not a sense of, I want to live a God-honoring life, then probably you've not experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because the grace and the love of Jesus Christ changes you. It sets you free to live. It changes your attitude. It changes your appetites. It changes your ambitions. And it changes your actions. So Paul speaks of the grace that gives us salvation. And he says in verse 11 that it has appeared to all men, all women, anyone can experience salvation. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, you and me, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He continues to call. He continues to pour out his grace and his mercy, not by works, but a free gift. But you have to open the door. You, you have to demonstrate faith. But, but his grace has appeared to all. There's not a single person who can't be saved. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. Anybody. There's no one who's too bad. There's no one who's too good. There's no one who's too old, too young, or too weird, or too cool to come to Jesus Christ. But you have to receive him. Grace comes knocking, offering forgiveness, offering the power to live a new life. And in Crete, where this was written, to Titus, who's been left there by Paul to establish sound doctrine and godly living and, 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 and leaders... It was a difficult culture, very carnal, ungodly culture that needed God's grace. Kind of reminds me of 
our culture. Do you think the culture's changed in the last 10 or so years? We live in a difficult culture. So I want you to hear this. Grace gives salvation. Grace offers a changed life. And then in verse 13 it says, Grace also causes us to look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It offers forgiveness. It offers a changed life. And it offers hope. Look, listen to what it says. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is coming back. Boy, if you read the Bible, if you listen or read the news, I think we could be pretty close to that. Amen. What's happening with Russia, the Mideast with Iran and Israel, if you know anything about the context of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 and what's happening in the Mideast and the coalition of nations that are coming together, it's exactly what the Bible declares and it's happening right before our eyes. It's insane. This crazy resurgence of anti-Semitism and hatred, not just of Israel, but of the Jewish people now again. It's bizarre what's going on. In, in his book, uh, I don't know if you know who Max Lucado is. He wrote a book recently called What's Next? He made this statement. He said, as I read the news, as I read my Bible, he said, as I listen to the pages of Scripture, I can hear the hoofbeats of a coming king. And I say, I do too. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Look what it says here. Looking for. Looking for the blessed hope. In the Greek, that term looking for carries the meaning of not just longing for, that's part of it. Not just waiting for, that's part of it. But an eager expectation of his coming. Not a wish, not saying, oh, wouldn't that be nice? But the context of hope here is a divinely promised reality and the certainty of the amazing appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why it's called, listen, the blessed hope. Which means it's a hope. When he uses that term, the blessed hope, it means it's a hope that's above all other hopes. You might have some hopes. You may be single here today and hope you get married. Be careful what you hope for. You might be here and, and you're, you're, you're married and you want to have kids. <laughs> or you're here and you say, oh, I hope I can go on a cruise. I, I, I hope I can lose some weight. I hope I have good health all through my life. I hope this summer heat will finally end. I hope I'll win the lottery. I hope the Chick-fil-A line won't be as long last week as it was this week. I hope I get that job. I hope Highway 98 gets finished in my lifetime. <laughs> I hope the election goes my way. Those are good hopes. But no hope compared to the blessed hope of the coming and appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He says he will appear. Listen to what it says. I love this, these, these, these verses. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it say? It says glorious appearing. Or, or, or may I summarize it like this. Paul takes us from the beginning, speaking about grace has appeared, to the end when he will appear in his glory. He takes us from grace to glory. And Jesus came full of grace in his first appearing, in his incarnation. He came to earth as, as, a, as a man. He came as a humble carpenter. He came as one who said, I have nowhere to lay my head. He, he came to, to us as a suffering savior who would go to the cross and lay down his life. He was grace, grace, 
grace personified. That's who he was. And because of his grace, they constantly criticized him. Oh, look, look, he eats with sinners. Yeah, he's full of grace. I wouldn't eat with that person. You're not full of grace. He, he touches an unclean leper. Yeah, he cares about the unclean people. He hangs with tax collectors. He washes feet. And I would say this about Jesus. He valued people. He valued them over rules. He valued truth over the law. He valued servanthood over religion. And he came for the sick. Not those who didn't think they needed help, but those who desperately knew they did. That's who he came for. He said, I'm the bread of life. It's something that everyone can have access to. Grace has appeared to all men and women. He says, if you were to eat of me, I would satisfy that hunger in your soul. It's by grace. He said, anyone who, who drinks of the water that I give will never thirst again. If you drink of me, he says, I'll quench that thirst in your life. That constant sense of emptiness. I came so they can have real life, eternal life, not just living forever, but a quality of life. He said, if I'm lifted up, crucified, I'll draw all people to myself because of my grace, his grace. But in his second coming, he won't be grace personified. He'll be glory personified. The amazing Blessed hope and his glorious appearing. You know, I, when I first came to the Lord, uh, my brother and I started going to a real Pentecostal church over in Pensacola. It was Assembly of God. How many people here ever went to an Assembly of God church? Oh. So you know, you know what I'm going to be talking about. Very Pentecostal. Very loud. A lot of speaking in tongues. Sometimes interrupting the message. Sometimes people twirling around. Sometimes their excitement, if you will, would disrupt. But I'll never forget the pastor, and you knew when he was going to do it. He, he would use that word glory all the time. And sometimes you would know when he would get in one of these kind of stances. He was about to go, well, glory! And you'd go... Wow, what was that? And he would do that all through the service. And I've been waiting to do that here for a long, <laughs> long time. <laughs> but he was into that, that glory statement. And, and I love this says here, that looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the personification of, of, he'll be the blazing Shekinah glory. Kind of what Peter, James, and John saw in the Mount of Transfiguration. They got, a, they got a slice of it. They got a tiny look at it in Matthew chapter 17. It says, after six days, maybe you remember the story, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as as light, they saw his glory in the way that no one had ever seen it before. In verse 14, it goes on and said, He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. He gave himself for us. It's an interesting term there. It means that, that he voluntarily went to the cross. Jesus himself would say, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. I give myself to it. He, 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 Peter reminds his readers in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And he makes you, as it says here, his own special people. Amen. The word special means different. We live a different life. 
He, he describes it here, his own special people. From lawless deeds, he redeems us for purity, to, to be different. We, we live a different and godly life, a Christ-honoring life in a very ungodly culture, just, just like in Crete. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Redeemed us from every lawless deed. Anyone here in this room ever done a lawless deed? Yeah. You sped down Highway 98 this morning. You've done some <laughs> lawless deeds. He gives himself. And, and the word redeem means to release someone who's been held captive like a prisoner or a slave by paying the ransom or the debt that was on their head. It's like the person who says, once they meet Christ, I, I, I was blind, but now I see a whole different way. I was lost, but now I'm found. I, I was filled with guilt or shame, and now I, I, that whole thing's rolled off of me. I've been forgiven. My life was bitter and hateful, and now I've learned how to forgive others. I was unclean because of my own lifestyle and sin, and I was stained. But now my sins that were scarlet, hey, they're, they're white as snow. This is what redemption means. You, you ever watch that show, I'm not sure it's still around, called Property Brothers? Got a picture of these. There, there they are. Right there. Not the most handsome guys, but um, they're twins, these two guys. Property Brothers, Jonathan and Drew. And, and they help people uh, find homes that are kind of run down, fixer-uppers, and renovate them for them. They, they, they show prospective buyers all kinds of homes. And people usually can't believe they could ever feel at home in one of these places. Until Jonathan takes his computer and he begins to show the space can be transformed into this. And he moves the walls around and it becomes this beautiful place to live in. And then they get to the, the bottom line and... and we can do all this for you. And they ask this question, you can do all that with our budget? And that's the only part I can't believe about the whole show. Maybe you've been there too, like, there's no way. I can't even get a bathroom for $38,000. <laughs> no, yeah, we can do that, all that on your budget. And let me say this, that God can do all this he can purify you for himself. He can make you his special people. He can teach you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. He can, he can change your life and rearrange it and make it completely different. And it's all on his budget. It's all free. It's his grace. God through Christ does that in your life and in my life. It's kind of like the temple. I don't know if you've ever studied the temple and all its furniture and how it was shaped and built. There's a courtyard. There's holy rooms. There's precious metal, jewels, fabric, and designs. And each of them symbolize something. If you ever walk through or study the tabernacle or the temple, every detail mattered in the tabernacle. And all of it, listen, all of it declared the glory and the grace of God. It's an amazing architectural prophecy, if you will, that God gives of what's to come through his son, Jesus Christ. There's grace, there's glory, and there's hope. And in some ways, all of those instruments and all those things that happen there picture the life that we can have in Christ. There's the lampstands. And we're to shine forth the truth together. There's the altar of incense, which represents incense of praise and prayers rising to God. There's the burnt offering for our sins, which represents Christ. There's the anointing oil that's there in the 
temple for, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There's the, there's the bread, the show bread, which is communion with God that we take together in communion. And there's that holy place where we can enter in because Christ died and that, that curtain was rent from top to bottom and now we freely go into the presence of God from his grace to his glory, sacrifice and cleansing to reveal the grace and glory and hope of Jesus Christ to the world. And God does all that. And he wants to continue to do that. Well, look, look what he says here. With his special people, zealous for good works, to tell others about him, to show other people who he is. That's one of the true signs, again, that you belong to him, that you have a desire and a heart, not only to look forward to his coming, that glorious appearing of Christ, but also to be involved in his good works. So, well, John, how do I do that? Well, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And his grace opens your heart to the power of his Holy Spirit and his presence within you. And he continually, in, in verse 15, our last verse, he says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. In other words, teach and exhort and encourage one another to live and practice these things. And then he goes on and he says, and rebuke with all authority. And here he's not talking about rebuking false doctrine. You know what he's talking about? Rebuking here, not unbelievers, but slackers who aren't living for Christ the way they should. Are there any slackers out there? We're all slack every once in a while. And we all need to be called back again and again, don't we? To living a righteous, Christ-centered life. And that's what he's talking about. This is God's call, God's truth. And he calls us to it. I want you to listen to, to this story. I, I borrowed it from Max Lucado's book. It's a true story. May 1st, 2023, a small aircraft with seven passengers crashed into one of the most remote parts of the world, the Amazon rainforest. True story. The Cessna was flying from one small village to a slightly larger one, hundreds of miles south of Bogota, Colombia. Evidently, the single-engine prop failed in midair, causing a forced meeting with the dense canopy of trees and the jungle's unforgiving floor. All seven passengers were presumed dead. The odds of survival were minimal. The search area was 100 miles long and 20 miles wide. It took Colombian special forces Two weeks just to locate the plane. They finally got there after two weeks. True story. And when they did, they were saddened to find that three of the seven passengers had perished upon impact. But also surprised to learn the other four, all children, ranging, siblings ranging from 13 years to 11 months, were nowhere to be found. So a 13-year-old, four of them, siblings, down to 11-month-old could not be found. Not on board and not around the crash site. So they stepped up the rescue efforts. They dispatched, the government did, 150 soldiers, 40 volunteers, and quite a few rescue dogs. And they're, they're searching the forest for these children. And they found clues of hope. Baby bottle here. Small footprints there. Use diapers. I mean, imagine 13 years old, four kids down to 11 months old. If those were our kids, they'd have been dead the first day, right? <laughs> they'd be like, is there a sweet frog around here? <laughs> There's a frog, but he's not too sweet. So they're, they're, they're lost. They're lost in this rainforest. So they, 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 they send out all these soldiers, all these volunteers. They see these clues. And the children, 
well, they'd been raised near the jungle. They, they knew what bugs to avoid if they could, what plants not to touch. And, and so they're, they're, they are, 13 and under. They're kids. How could they still be alive? Days turn into weeks. Desperation grew. Rescuers are dropping boxes of food and water and even whistles, hoping the kids would blow a whistle and give them some kind of clue and, and trying to sustain the children with these things they dropped. But day after day, nothing ended in despair. After more than a month, the search began to suspect that the children were hiding from them. It turns out there were more than once after they finally rescued them, we'll tell the rest of the story, that they found they were at least 50 feet from them over and over again. And the children didn't know that the men had come to hurt or help, so they refused to make themselves known. It's kind of like the story in the, in the Garden of, of Eden, if you remember from Genesis uh, chapter 3. I'll just read it real quickly. I don't have it marked, but you know this story. Adam and Eve are pushed out of the garden, and it says they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden, kind of like these kids. They're hiding. And it tells us that the Lord called to Adam, where, where are you, Adam? And it's kind of like, uh, of course, we know here, here's the God of the universe who created all things. It, there's no way he's lost the only two people on the planet. Like, it's like, like God, well, I don't know. No, no, no. It, it's a question. Where are you, Adam, in relationship to me? Where, where's your heart? What about my plan for your life? And God has, since the beginning of time, been looking, been calling, sending message after message, miracle after miracle, patriarchs, matriarchs, prophets, preachers. You read the stories in the Old Testament, God would use a fish, he would use a donkey, he'd use a burning bush to get people's attention. These Colombians continued to search, and they finally came up with a plan. What could convince the children to come out of hiding? Well, they, they lowered speakers down into the jungle, and they turned up the volume so a message could be heard over a mile in every direction. And they broadcasted an invitation to the children, and they used the voice of their beloved grandmother. The grandmother was talking through these speakers. Children come out, calling them by name. These people are here to help you. And on day 40, 40, all four children, emaciated, insect bitten, dehydrated, weak, and most of all afraid, came out of hiding and were found. True story the grandmother's voice called them out of the shadows. They just needed a voice that they could trust and recognize. And God sent his son to rescue us. Not only does he call us to himself, but he also died for us, paid the ultimate price. He, and he gives an invitation to those who are lost and to those who hide. And there's a lot of hiding that goes on. People hide behind their work. They hide behind their status. They hide behind their busyness. They hide behind denial and pride and shame and guilt. They don't want to be known. But Jesus comes and he says, Hey, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And that's who he is. He, he comes with grace and, and he knocks and, and we have to... Say to it, well, will I, will I just demonstrate faith? Will I, will I open that door? Will I trust him? Will I, will I come out of hiding and come to him? Maybe today you sense him speaking to you, calling to you. That's what he does. He knocks on the door of your heart, and he won't force himself in. He could, but he doesn't because he's a savior of grace, and he 
wants you to respond. Give you an opportunity to come to him. He doesn't overwhelm you or force you. It's, it's based on grace and love and, and, and you recognizing who he is and what he's done for you. And then opening your heart to him. And then he begins to give you the, the strength and the power to live a changed life. You say, John, how do you know that's true? I know it's true. I've experienced it. At the age of 18, high school dropout, all kinds of stuff going on in my life. There came a knock on the door of my heart. My older brother gave me a Bible. I had no a Bible. What do you do with that? And he continued to knock and continued to knock till finally I opened that door and life has never been the same since. That's what Jesus does. And maybe you're here today and, and you've never given him the opportunity to come into your life. If you haven't, I would more than anything believe that he's knocking on the door of your heart or else why would you be here? <laughs>